This presentation is brought to you by the SDG Decision Education Center. Now, I'd like to introduce today's moderator, Carl Spetzler. Carl is an author, speaker, and consultant who has spent most of his career working with top management and boards to make big bet strategic decisions that influence the future of the enterprise. He is chairman of management consulting firm Strategic Decisions Group. Carl, welcome to today's webinar. Thank you, Wendy. And first, let me extend my welcome to everyone that has signed on. And uh, I'd also like to mention that uh, this is our 40th anniversary year for SDG. And in celebration of that milestone, we'll be continuing to conduct a series of webinars that really feature decision quality and decision science and SDG thought leadership. So look forward to those. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce Eric Bickel, a professor at the University of Texas, Austin. Uh, he teaches courses and leads research and decision analysis and in the application of it to business and public policy. He's the academic director of the Strategic Decision and Risk Management Certificate Program, uh, which uh, is, is really important in the sense that it combines SDG and UT Macomb School of Business and really focuses on this field of strategic decision and risk management, which is our specialty. Uh, he's also an SDG partner, a member of our board of directors, and Eric. I understand from uh, Texas Executive Education that you recently won a teaching award at the University of Texas for your contribution to executive education and to this certificate program that we have. Uh, congratulations on that honor. Well, thank you, Carl. I couldn't have done it without, without you, Bruce Judd, and, and Ron Howard. You really taught me a lot. Well, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about our SDR program after today's uh, presentation by Eric. And uh, I think in uh, this conversation, we should also mention that uh, some of the work that uh, Eric will be presenting has been done with one of his PhD students, Colin Small. Uh, that's right, Eric, right? That's right. And uh, we'll start with a poll uh, just to get a sense of our audience. So if we could have that poll and uh, <clears throat> So what are the reasons that are most important in your choice to attend today's webinar? Uh, and the responses can be, I'm a decision professional who builds decision models. I'm a decision maker who wants to understand decision models. I'm interested in how well models have forecast COVID-19 or something else. And uh, we're, we're getting responses in now. Let's see if we can do this relatively quickly. Uh, Eric, as the responses are coming in, I think you've got a, a good mix of the first three here of decision professionals, decision makers, and uh, an interest in general in the models and how they have forecast. If we close the, the poll and see what the responses are, uh, you can see here, it's, all, it's a pretty good mix of the first three. Nobody said something else. Uh, I, I guess that now that I see 3%. Uh, so someone must have said something else. I'd be interested in what that is someday. Maybe you can answer, uh, let us know in the chat or in the question box. So let me turn it over to you, Eric. Okay, thank you very much, Carl. And thank you to everyone that's joined. Uh, appreciate you taking time out of your day. Uh, we're excited to present this to you. And then again, just thanks to Colin Small, my PhD student who's helped uh, quite a bit uh, with this over the last uh, several months. Uh, so here's a, the agenda. I wanna go through a little bit of background introduction, talk briefly about the model that we developed. Uh, we'll in, introduce some other models and then talk about the accuracy of all these models um, in terms of forecasting COVID-19 uh, over the last year. I've um, discussed this in some other venues. Uh, people have asked if I could update it and present it again. And 
I'm hoping that this is the final installment and that we are, um, you know, that we're almost through uh, this. And so I think the accuracy results are unlikely to change uh, after this point. So my goals for the, the talk today, I'm really focused more on what we can learn about modeling um, in general, not really specifically COVID-19, though I think that that is interesting. Um, but for me, the the subtext to all this is just what is a good model and how do we quantify that and what can we learn from all the different models and uh, take that into our other, other practice. Um, so I'm not an epidemiologist, uh, and the model that I built is really, uh, really simple. And maybe it's best thought of as a forecasting benchmark um, rather than uh, a model itself. It's, as you'll see, it's very simple. So you could argue maybe that the other models ought to be able to do uh, at least uh, as good as this. So Colin and I, we've tried to analyze the accuracy of other models to the best of our ability. And we've chosen different models to illustrate a range of modeling approaches. Of course, if we've made any mistakes, uh, we're happy to correct those. Um, as you probably know, there's many different organizations forecasting COVID-19 uh, cases and deaths. This is a display from the uh, Centers for Disease Control, CDC. And uh, hard to read here, but these are just many different organizations that are providing forecasts. Uh, this is uh, for deaths. This line here is history, okay, and thankfully they've been coming down. Uh, but then you can see a very wide range of forecasts going into the future, right, including this model here, which is predicting a, a large uptick. And this was as of May 17th. Um, the CDC also produces an, what they call an ensemble, which is some averaging of all these models. And uh, how they come up with that average, I think is a deeper question, but you could think of perhaps taking a weighted average based on past performance of different uh, models. And so what the CDC is forecasting right now is by the week ending June 12th, there'll be 594,000 to 604,000 uh, COVID-19 deaths. That's this chart here, which is cumulative. These are daily, and this down here is cumulative. So many different models, wide range of forecasts. Looks like a significant amount of uncertainty. Um, there's been a lot of discussion. If you remember now, um, this is back in February, March of 2020. Uh, this article uh, was on uh, 538. March of 2020, why it's so hard to make a good model, COVID-19 model, um, where the models are headed, why they disagree, and then the tricky math behind uh, corona coronavirus uh, death predictions. And you can see one of the model outputs here. But th this was a big topic early on, and particularly the fact that there were asymptomatic cases and are the models picking those up? Uh, so UT closed in mid-March, the campus closed, and so I found myself at home and wondering when we might be able to go back. I couldn't find any forecasting models at that time. That was early in March. So I started to build a simple model. I published it you know, in, on LinkedIn. Uh, I'd never tried to participate in the CDC modeling efforts. I'm not an epidemiologist, and my model was you know, runs in Excel and you know was really simple sort of embarrassed to even talk about it because it was uh, so simple. Um, also at this time, what was happening was uh, there's a gentleman at UMass Amherst, Thomas McAndrew, and he was gathering these forecasts that were being made from different experts, different models, and was keeping track uh, of them weekly, their forecasts and comparing it to actuals. And then this was also being published in 538. So here's, here's an example forecast. Some model was saying, this was as of April 5th of last year. Um, currently there had been uh, 141,000 cases at that time. And this model was saying um, just five days ahead, there could be anywhere from 250,000 to a million cases, right? And so just, 
didn't make sense to me in terms of how wide that uncertainty band was. And then you can see some of the other forecasts. And this was intriguing. Why are they so different? Why is there so much uncertainty in some cases? And the consensus, uh, Thomas was computing a consensus, it was like the average of these models, was there'd be 386,000 uh, cases. Well, my model, I said, well, I'm gonna keep track of this. My model forecasts 339,000 cases. And uh, so I was off um, the, uh, the actual was 333,000 cases. So I was off by 2% and this consensus of these expert models was off by 16%. And this was only you know five days in advance. And this you know, provided some encouragement. You know, what's going on here? This is interesting. Let's keep track of this. Uh, and so that, as I mentioned at the outset, that was really the subtext. What can we learn about modeling from these results? Uh, so now I'm going to describe the model that we developed. I call it a naive model. Sometimes we call it a simple model. You sort of go back and forth between those. But here's a way to think about it. Uh, this is what we would call an influence diagram in decision analysis or perhaps a decision diagram. We'd like to, what we care about perhaps we want to forecast is the number of deaths, the number of cases, uh, and then the number of people recovered. If I knew the number of cases and I knew the fatality rate, then I could estimate the number of deaths. Uh, if I want to estimate the number of cases, perhaps if I knew how many people had been exposed and the infection rate, then I could estimate the number of cases number of exposures, how many people are susceptible and to what degree are they interacting with each other, how many people are currently infected. And perhaps I could I could forecast that. So it's like we peeling an onion, we just peel this back. And this uh, you get to a point where you have how many people are asymptomatic. There's you want to know how many people are infected, but how many have been identified and how many are asymptomatic. And that has to do with something called the under ascertainment rate, which was the, the rate of asymptomatic people. This model has a general structure that most of the other models have in that there's a susceptible group, an exposed group, an infected group, and a recovered group. And you've probably heard of these SEIR models or these compartmental models. This is probably the most common model type that would model how people move through this. We make policy decisions. Uh, for example, perhaps we develop therapeutics, which has some effect on the fatality rate. Uh, maybe we tell people to wear masks or uh, socially distance, and that could lower the uh, maybe the interaction rate or or the the infection rate. But this is it's simple here, but it's already pretty complicated. How are we going to figure out how many people are asymptomatic? I didn't know all that, and I said, well, I'll just summarize all this stuff in here with a growth rate. We have the number of identified cases, and then there's some growth rate, and that's going to result in a number of new cases. Instead of trying to model these things explicitly, let's summarize them. And that's the thrust of the simple model. I'm not going to try to break it apart. I'm going to have a single parameter to summarize these things. Um, Eric, uh, let me interject here for a second and say uh, this model or, or let's say the full influence diagram that you showed would be recognized by and, and agreed to by most other modelers, right? I believe so, yeah. 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 Okay. yeah Thank you. Yeah. Capturing just the dynamics. It's of kind of a universally accepted understanding of the problem. I think so. So the, the model we developed has just two equations. And apologize for the math here, but um, I think it's unavoidable. One is the number of cases at some time t in the future. Uh, we're going to assume here that cases grow exponentially. And I think that that's what we understand about how viruses spread. They spread exponentially and at some growth rate g. 
and G is the growth in the number, uh, the growth rate in the number of cases. That's what we'd like to know. Uh, if you take logs of both sides, it ends up this being uh, a linear function, and so it's pretty easy to estimate G from uh, from data. And this is just a plot here after I've taken the log. If it really is growing exponentially, this should look like a straight line, and this is what it did look like early on. Um, and so then I plotted this very early on. This is back February 23rd of 2020. Uh, you remember South Korea was a bit ahead and Italy was ahead uh, in terms of the number of infections. And this is a plot of that growth rate G as a function of time. And so when I plotted this, right, that's interesting. The growth rate can't be constant. If the growth rate was constant, then it would just grow until everybody had it. But people are socially distancing, taking certain precautions and so forth. And so what you saw was actually the growth rate declined with time. This was days from the 100th case. And this is pretty critical. And I said, well, that looks like it's declining exponentially. So the second equation is let's model the growth rate itself as a function of time and say that it decreases exponentially and this parameter here k is what's really important k is the second derivative it's the rate at which the growth rate is changing and that i think ends up being key to the whole model and that's what we really need to forecast if we can forecast k then we can calculate g and then we can calculate uh, the cases themselves so those are those are the two equations I would say it has two initial conditions, the initial cases, the initial growth rate, and then this parameter K, this single parameter, which can be estimated easily through linear regression. Now, something I learned later, a few months later, was these two equations form what's known as the Gompertz function, which uh, has been used for a couple hundred years to model human mortality when there's an exponentially increasing rate of death. Here we have sort of an exponentially decreasing growth rate. And so that's why they're the, the same model. But I, th I thought that was interesting. And I call this a simple model or a naive model in the sense of it just being straightforward. Um, and so I'm going to go over these next few slides relatively quickly. But using data, we can just perform a simple linear regression to estimate these parameters. This was as of April 1st of 2020. Uh, so this was right at the beginning, and here, here was the uh, this growth rate data. And then I'm fitting a straight line to it, if you take the log of this and you can fit a straight line. And I made this forecast here, this dotted line was the forecast. And then this was what the actual growth rate was out for the next 40 days. And it's hard to see the forecast underneath all those actuals. So it was pretty amazingly accurate <laughs> uh, then. And so that was some further encouragement that let's keep looking at this. And so we provided forecast on a daily basis uh, over this time, and this is some comparisons. And I kept comparing to the forecast that the uh, experts were providing or these models were providing. And this simple model beat them through like the second week of May, beat them in seven out of nine uh, weeks. Um, so uh, let me talk about one other more technical issue. We want to use this data to fit our model. And uh, there's a bit of a reporting problem. You see this spikiness here in cases and this spikiness in the number of deaths, daily deaths. And it ends up that over twice as many deaths are reported on Wednesdays as on Sundays. And so there's a reporting lag or error that we have to smooth out. This is sort of introducing additional uncertainty into our model that we don't really want. And so what we do is we just compute a seven day average. And this is what most of the other models do. They compute a seven day average for cases uh, and for deaths. These are sun Mondays and Sundays 
Um, this is like the growth rate in deaths, and then this is the rest of the week. And you can see there really is a big reporting issue. Okay, that's our model. Let me talk quickly about some other models, and then I can show you some results. Uh, one model uh, that was used quite a bit, uh, there's a model uh, called Delphi from MIT. It's one of these compartmental models, an SEIR model. And they were providing daily forecasts of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. It has uh, eight possible states. So it's really not just this susceptible, exposed, infected, recovered. There's more states than that. It's more complicated than that. It has nine parameters, two initial conditions, six constants, um, like the incubation time. It also includes a function for governmental response. Uh, and it's quite a big team that works on this model. Uh, another model was uh, called YYG. Uh, this was by a single individual, really quite impressive, and was an SEIR model that provided daily forecasts of deaths. So not all the models do cases. Um, more people were forecasting uh, deaths, with the idea being that that data is more observable than cases because of the asymptomatic problem. There were some other models that I would call curve fitting, perhaps, uh, the, um, where they just posit that cumulative deaths are going to follow some functional form and uh, then fit that uh, model to the data. The IHME model uh, was like that uh, to start. So here's IHME, uh, Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. This was one of the first models and um, they're forecasting deaths on a weekly basis. Originally, it was a curve fit model, but then after May, they built an SEIR model, and then they started averaging those two results. University of Texas had a model. I wasn't involved in this, but um, it was originally a curve fit model, and then they created an SEIR model, SEIR model, and took some kind of an average of those two things. And then Los Alamos National Laboratory had a model, and it is what I would call a time series model. It's very similar to our model, I would say, in terms of spirit um, and application, but more complicated. It it has it's based on growth rates with a time series, and they were forecasting cases and deaths uh, twice a week, and they also included a full uncertainty range around their forecasts. Uh, which is interesting, and we do the same thing, and we talk about the relative uh, accuracy of those. Now, there's really a spectrum of models from what I would call top-down to bottom-up. Top-down are these curve-fit models. You're not explicitly modeling the system, but any emergent behavior, how the system performs, is assumed to have some functional form. IHME and the early UT model, I think, are in that category. Then there's time series models where we're modeling some of the system dynamics, but with macro level parameters. I would put the naive model that we built in that and then the LANL model. Then more detailed would be these SCIR models where we break the system down into components and then we have to put it all back together. And at the lowest level are agent-based models where people built models of, uh, that model individuals. So you're modeling a town and there's 500 individuals in the town and you're trying to model each one uh, person individually. Okay, so we had a, we have a poll here, if we could launch that. And the question is, what type of models are used most frequently in your organization? So I don't know if these terms will translate for you, but is it a high level model? What I'm calling a top down model or are, are using very detailed models, which roll up things maybe from the, the bottom up, or maybe you don't use models. We just use hard-coded time series or something else. And, and Eric, you're asking this not now about COVID, you're really asking this about modeling and uh, the kind of use of models in the organizations that are represented by the participants, right? That's right, yeah, thank you, Carl. Yeah. 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 Okay, so it looks like the, the results are 
coming in here and we've got uh, almost uh, half the results in. I think this is a pretty good sample, so maybe we could uh, close the poll. And uh, it looks like more frequently on bottom-up models, about half. That's certainly been my experience on uh, working on projects in this area with uh, with clients. Um, and then some top, a few top-down models. And good to see not a lot of people are using hard-coded time series. Okay. All right, so let's talk about the accuracy of these different models. And in order to do that, we need some measure of accuracy. And you could think about different ways to do this. Uh, what Colin and I thought made the most sense was to compute the error in additional cumulative cases. So for example, let's suppose that we're currently sitting at 100,000 cases and we forecast that we'll be at 140,000 cases in 10 days. That's a forecast of 40,000 additional cases. If we end up getting 170,000 cases, then the forecast was for 70,000 additional cases. And the accuracy would be our forecast of 40 minus the actual of 70 divided by 70, which is we were under by 43%. Now we're ultimately gonna take the absolute value of that because we don't want to average it out and say, well, it's okay to be 40% over and then 40% under, uh, over and then 40% under and let those cancel out. So we're gonna take the absolute value of that. Um, so this is just a little example. This is back July 10th of last year. IHME on July 7th, they were forecasting 7,470 additional cases by July 17th, um, additional deaths. In reality, there were 8,810 additional deaths. That was an error of 15%. And if we took the absolute value, it would be just 15%. That's how we are going to quantify the error. Most of the models um, only forecast 28 days ahead. And at least the CDC is publishing forecasts up to four weeks ahead or 28 days ahead. So that's how far we're going to look. And here's the results for the accuracy in the cases. What I have here is the number of days ahead that you're trying to forecast. And then this, the average absolute percent error, on average, what's the error of these models? The solid thick line, this is the simple model. And then the other lines here are other um, models from some of the other groups here. So this top one, for example, this is the MIT uh, model, compartmental model. Uh, this one here at the bottom, is the um, is called LNQ, which is a, a machine learning model. And then the table, we, we listed the different models. We have accuracy for the four largest states, but let's just look at the United States overall. LNQ, their average error was 15%. The simple model, the average error was 19%. Um, this is the CDC ensemble, their error was was 18%. So, so a couple things to notice, uh, Carl, one, and then I'll uh, pause. One, the uh, the air is increasing with time. So that makes sense the further out you try to go. Uh, but it's really amazing how accurate this simple model, two equations, one parameter can be. These are very complicated models. The ensemble model is probably the most complicated. It's an average of all the models that are being sub submitted to the CDC. And the simple model is essentially as accurate as that. Yeah, and and uh, do I read that graph right, uh, Eric, that the errors that these various models have are systematically either high or low? They stay they stay kind of relative to their actuals. They keep yeah, doing that, it the same. Point, yeah, this is if you're high, if they're high seven days ahead, then they tend to be a high twenty days ahead. Yeah, yeah. This chart here is interesting. It's how often the simple model was more accurate. So the LMQ model had 15% accuracy, a little bit better than the simple model. And in fact, it 
it beat us 52% of the time. Only 48% of the days did we beat the LNQ model. But all these other models, actually, we beat them most of the time. Um, but when we were off, we were off by a little bit more. And that makes some sense. It's a simple time series statistical model. They're using a lot more information. So, okay, so I think that's kind of amazing. Um, we could do the same thing for deaths. Again, this is the simple model. This is for the U.S. as a whole. And here, the best model for deaths is a model produced by Oliver Wyman um, company. And that is a compartmental model we listed here. It's one of these compartmental models. And so it performed very well for the U.S. And this is the CDC ensemble, YYG, USC. And then here's our simple model. And then you can see some of the others down here. And here, there were four models that beat us most of the time. Now, one of those being the CDC ensemble. Okay, but but the simple model beat these other models, you know, a large percentage of the time. Uh, the other thing to look at is the uncertainty interval. And all the models are providing a 95% probability interval, that the number of cases and the number of deaths should fall within their interval 95% of the time. Okay, for IHME, the first version of IHME, 100% of the time the actual fell in their 95% interval, okay, which actually isn't good. I mean, it's not bad, but <laughs> their, their range was too wide. The simple model for the U.S., the actuals fall within our interval about 99% of the time. YYG was real ca well calibrated 95% of the time. But by and large, the other models are not well calibrated. They are not representing uncertainty very well. Their forecasts are much too narrow. Okay. Um, this I'm going to cover quickly, but just how did these different models perform? Different model types, because that's what we'd like to learn from, I think. The curve fit models don't perform well, and I don't think that's surprising. They're very high level. Uh, the machine learning models, you know, it's kind of all over the map, but, you know, they did okay. Um, the This is our model here, uh, what I'm calling a statistical time series model. I think the statistical time series models tend to be clustered. They, they tend to perform maybe better, and their performance is not as dispersed. These compartmental models, some of them did very well, but a lot of them are really bad. Uh, so it seems like it's easy to build a bad compartmental model. And I think that's a good a good learning. And then here we have the, the ensemble, uh, CDC ensemble model. Okay, I'm interested in time. That's just breaking it out by state. Um, I'm happy to distribute these slides, but I think we should move on. We had uh, another poll question for you, and that's on a scale of one to five. Again, thinking about your the modeling in your organization, not necessarily COVID, how accurate would you say your models are? So um, they're not accurate. <laughs> it's just a random walk. They're somewhat accurate, uh, not useful for, uh, for decision-making, moderately accurate. Maybe they're mostly accurate or, um, we're a role model for accuracy. So what do you? We probably should have had Carl here. Uh, I don't know, because <laughs> my experience is usually the uh, the accuracy of these models is not really tracked. Well, Eric, I find a lot of confusion between precision and accuracy, and most people think that the more precise and detailed pre that goes into precision, the more they believe it, which is really a confusion of precision with accuracy. Is that your experience in this? I think that's a great point, and that, that's one of the main points I want to drive home here. So why don't we close the poll? And uh, like mo most people, about half saying moderately, uh, moderately accurate uh, here. So a good question would be, are you really quantifying the accuracy of the models you're using? within your company. So I'll, I'll leave that as something to think about. Uh, so let's see, if we go ahead and 
close that and I'll go back to the slides here. All right, so yeah, let's talk about some conclusions, Carl, and then I, I wanna come back to your point, which I think is uh, a really good one. This is the forecast as of May 17th. The naive or the simple model is forecasting, we'll have 599,000 cumulative deaths um, by the end of the week on June 12th. Our P95, our P5 to P95 range is 594,000 to 606,000. And then this is what the CDC ensemble is forecasting. They're saying they'll be between 594,000 and 604,000. So essentially identical to what the simple model is. So after the CDC takes all of these models, some of which are very, very complex, and averages them together, they get essentially what the simple model uh, gives. And um, again, I think it's really interesting. That model is could be built, um, you know, built it in Excel. Anybody with a class you know, in statistics could could build that model. Right, it's not um, out of out of your reach. Okay. So, takeaways, uh, kind of a funny one that you probably heard. Predictions hard, especially about the future. I thought that was Yogi Berra, but I looked it up, and I guess it was Niels Bohr. Um, quite interesting that a simple model outperformed more complicated models. I think that's very important for us. Um, a lot of the some of the other models are more complicated because they in include policy variables, like what happens if we issue a mask mandate. I think you could extend the simple model to do that, perhaps. Um, but to Carl's point, people confuse, and this is what I learned from Ron and mentioned in another talk, cogency versus verisimilitude. So models that have the ability to compel versus models that are true to life. And people tend to think models have to be true to life to be accurate. And I think that's a big mistake, as you see here. As you add detail to these COVID models, you add many, many, many different um, stages or states, susceptible, infected, and so on. You break it into pieces, but ultimately you have to put it back together. And this is what my Humpty Dumpty you know, saying. So you, you be what be uh wary of Humpty Dumpty models. If you break the model apart, you've got to put it back together again. And that requires really careful thought, maybe lots of data. And the simple model avoids all that. It never breaks it all apart. Everything is summarized in the growth rate itself. And so from a business perspective, I think that's important. I would lean towards models that are top-down um, models rather than pushing for lots and lots of detail and many times companies go in the opposite direction so well when i stop there carl and if you wanted and, to and, add and, uh, let let me add some of uh, our experiences that go back over 50 years now on this uh the when people add accuracy especially when they use deterministic dynamic modeling which goes back to forecasts of overpopulation and hunger and world demise and now uh, many of the climate models uh, this accurate determinist uh, you know, where they're trying to get precision deterministically with dynamics versus using simple models and adding uncertainty it's kind of you, you in a simple model, it's much easier to add the uncertainty and, and take the implications of the uncertainty into account. And the, it seems to me they're almost like two schools of modeling on that. And I believe while the dynamics part has gotten a lot of attention in terms of predictions, the actual usefulness for decision making is the simpler model with added uncertainty beats it in decision and policy decisions hands down would that am i simplifying too much here no i i think we're in agreement on that so somebody will say well does your model include asymptomatic cases well not explicitly well then it can't be right right because there's some detail in the world that's not in the model but it is there in a highly summarized way 
I, th I think uh -huh. you see this in oil and gas forecasting. If we want to forecast the price of oil, people might build very detailed supply demand models, all the wells in the world and all the, the demand for oil. Um, that's a huge model and it's going to take a long time to run. It's going to be hard to include uncertainty where we can build a very simple statistical model and it tends to perform much, much better. And, and and when you're when you're realistic, let's take for example the oil price. Okay, I, I remember a conversation with some senior executives. And I said, so the the 1090 range on oil prices is between thirty six dollars and one hundred and thirty six dollars over the next five years. <laughs> and they said, well, anybody could have said that. You it seems like you know nothing. So to be an expert, you have to pretend precision how much do you think this incentive to to uh, project precision as an expert gets in the way here I'm very strong and we talk about that in the biases course that we have in the SDRM program um, experts are supposed to know so uh, you go to the doctor and you want them to be able to say exactly what's wrong with you so we tend yeah. to expect that. Uh, I, I see in, in the comments and questions here a couple of things. Uh, and one of them is a, a great demonstration of the power of simple models, better roughly right than precisely wrong. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah, I, yeah. I think that's very much your theme. Yeah. Uh, so would it be fair to say, and I'm reading from some of the questions that came came in, would it be fair to say that most of these models are not very good at forecasting uh, growth changes in general, the next wave, for example, of new infections? So, one, I mean, one thing, some of the models were, did perform very well. Um, the, the Oliver Wyman model performed very well. It's a very big team, I think. So I would just say, I think it's hard to build a model like that. It's going to take a lot of a lot of uh, effort. Mm -hmm. um, now, sure. forecasting subsequent waves, this model, none of these models have the ability to do that. This is all, you know, four weeks ahead. Yeah, yeah. So, Good. Carl, I know you were going to mention a little bit on learning more. I don't know if you want to. Well, yeah, let's, uh, some questions around this. Well, first of all, we'll have upcoming webinars uh, in June and July. A new approach to early stage portfolio decision making will be the next one and then embracing uncertainty to sharpen scenario planning and forecasting uh, will be our next webinars. And let's also say a couple of words about the SDRM program if you're interested in the understanding decision quality and its implications in many different uh, settings in an organization. Uh, our series of courses and the certificate program at UT, where Eric is the academic director and uh, I'm one of the lecturers uh, and our team works very closely to bring the, the pragmatic practical uh, capability of SDG that uh, kind of applied decision science to all of that. We've got uh, one that's coming up in June uh, where I know Eric and I will be a, a big part. That's the multi-party decision quality, where you, you in essence, have a multi-criteria, multi-party setting, which goes all the way from collaboration to competition and takes the decision quality paradigm into that domain, which, which I think is a, a complex setting and a, a difficult setting. And most real decisions, uh, supply chain or co competitive decisions all fall into that category. So uh, all these are coming up. Uh, we invite you to continue the conversation. If you have questions, here's Eric's uh, contact information. And let me hand it back to Wendy now that we've completed our presentation. Thank you, Eric and Carl, and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar.